I hope that our presenters will have a couple of minutes at the end just to take questions, and then we'll present the awards at the very end of the ceremony, if that's fine. I want to call on Dr. Michael Mildy uh, to bring greetings on behalf of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, and also to introduce our second award winner, uh, Dr. Groden. So, Michael. And I too would like to take the opportunity to uh, congratulate the winners and Michael, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful award and a real achievement. Uh, distinguished guest, guests, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Groden. Professor Groden earned his PhD from Princeton in 1975 and came to Western in that year. He became a full professor in 1983, and he was named Distinguished University Professor in 2006 and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 2007. He is Canada's, and perhaps the world's, preeminent scholar of James Joyce and Joyce's masterpiece, Ulysses. In recognition of his eminence in the field of Joyce scholarship, he was awarded an honorary D. Litt from the National University of Ireland. This honor was confirmed appropriately on Bloomsday, June 16, 2004, the 100th anniversary of the day on which Joyce's novel, Ulysses, is set. The English people in the crowd will get it. <laughs> the Schulich people will tell you about it at the reception. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Groden's work has been recognized and supported by a wide variety of grants and awards, including a prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship, the first ever won by a member of Western's faculty, and one of only a handful granted to Canadian academics in the past 35 years. Professor Groden's influence has been immense. His first book, Ulysses in Focus, established, for the first time, the complex sequence in which Joyce wrote Ulysses demonstrating how the hundreds of surviving drafts, typed scripts, and page proofs relate to each other. U Ulysses uh, may safely be called the most important novel of the 20th century, and Professor Groden's portrait of Joyce in the process of reinventing the English novel has stood unchallenged since he published the book. This initial work then led to three substantial projects. The first was the James Joyce Archive, a 63-volume collection of Joyce's extant manuscript in photo facsimile. Second, in the 1990s, Professor Groden began work on the James Joyce Ulysses in I Hypermedia, later it became the Digital Ulysses, a multimedia and hypermedia presentation of the novel. And then third, in September 2001, a cache of 25 Joyce manuscripts was discovered. These turned out to be early drafts of parts of Ulysses, uh, and which had been thought lost or destroyed. Professor Groden was invited uh, to be the National Library of Ireland's consultant on the acquisition, he assessed the contents and advised the library to spend whatever was necessary to acquire the papers. <laughs> <laughs> the library eventually purchased the documents for eight million pounds, 25 manuscripts. Of <laughs> and, but the library now lays claim to be the world's foremost repository of choice manuscripts. In addition to his scholarly work, Professor Groden has been a respected teacher and mentor. The University Students Council has consistently recognized his outstanding undergraduate teaching. Among graduate students, he has been one of the most sought after members of the English program, where he has been chief supervisor for 14 completed PhDs so far, the 14th completed just this morning, as I found out. <laughs> <clears throat> in 2000, he began to teach six-week courses on Joyce's Ulysses for adults at the 92nd Street YMYWHA in New York City, one of the city's premier cultural institutions. In 2008 and 2009, he taught similar courses in Toronto, um, uh, inspired, like his teaching at Western by the Digital Ulysses Project, these courses have been highly successful and have guided people from all walks of life through Joyce's challenging text. In sum, Professor Groden is an outstanding scholar and citizen of the university and a worthy recipient of the Helmut Prize. Professor Groden. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I'm, I'm delighted to be sharing this afternoon with Dr. Chambers. Um, I've called my presentation Dancing with a Star, but don't worry, I'm not going to dance with you today. <laughs> Although being awarded this award, this Helmuth Prize, does tempt me to break out in a, in a two step. Um, I'm an English professor who spends much of my life reading, studying, writing about, and teaching novels. Most often one specific novel, uh, James Joyce's Ulysses. I name this book fully aware of the reaction that it tends to provoke. On the one hand, as the 1990s ended, Ulysses was designated the English language novel of the century. Um, but on the other, it conjures up fears that it can't be understood by ordinary mortals without a nearby bookcase full of guidebooks and reference volumes, 
as well as a personal reading trainer and coach. <laughs> it has settled into a fairly fixed position in our culture as both a crucial work and a daunting, even unreadable one. If the saying is true that one definition of a human being describes that being as the only animal that buys books it doesn't read, <laughs> then Ulysses has done as much as any work of art to help a lot of people assert their humanity. <laughs> I own many books that I haven't read, but Ulysses isn't one of them. I've read it and reread it and reread it. And I should mention as an aside that Patrick Casey, who's a graduate student whose who's PhD thesis I, I supervised, um, has also reread it, and, and Patrick successfully defended his dissertation um, at his oral this morning. So he's joined the crowd. Um, a summary of the contents of Ulysses doesn't jive with such repeated attention, concerning, as it does, um, three relatively ordinary people in Dublin living their lives on one day, June 16, 1904. The 22-year-old, arrogant but uncertain, somewhat lost, would-be poet Stephen Dedalus. The 38-year-old advertising canvasser Leopold Bloom, who walks around the city streets all day and evening. A Jewish man, and therefore forever an outsider in his native Dublin. And his 33-year-old wife Molly, Joyce's Penelope figure, who waits at home all day for her husband to return, but waits even more urgently for the arrival of her concert manager with whom she will soon begin an affair. Nothing at all of major significance happened in the world on this day, at least in the Western world. That was one of the reasons Joyce picked it for his story. Some important events do take place in the main character's private lives, but mostly the day becomes memorable because Joyce takes us deep into his character's minds, recording their ongoing thoughts almost as if a tape recorder is capturing every one of them. We come to know these characters better than we could ever know another person even better than we can probably know ourselves. Joyce took the chance that a graphic de depiction of a few people experiencing one day would be a new and interesting topic for a work of fiction, might even be a kind of modern epic, and he turned out to be correct. This one day, now known as Bloomsday, is surely the most famous single day in literature. As June 16, 2004 approached Bloomsday centenary, the Globe and Mail ran an article under the headline one day turns 100. Behind its unfamiliar styles, its details about Dublin and popular culture from the early 20th century, and numerous literary quotations and allusions, Ulysses brings up important, vital issues, such as how people can move, up, move on from personal sadness and tragedies, how someone might face and respond to bigotry, anti-Semitism in this case, and how men and women realistically live as sexual human beings and what, in a committed relationship, might constitute fidelity. More broadly, Ulysses discovers comedy and humor in many, many places you wouldn't expect to find them, and asks whether ordinary people can be modern versions of Homeric heroes. In a more strictly literary realm, it explores how its story can be told, since, after presenting half the book in the original interior monologue style, taking us into the characters' minds, Joyce starts experimenting wildly and tells each episode using one different method after another. And he exploits the English language in every way he can, finding possibilities that no one had discovered before and few people have since. Besides giving us Ulysses, Joyce left hundreds, thousands of pages of notes, drafts, and proofs for the book. Most of these documents have been available since the 1960s, scattered among libraries from Buffalo, Philadelphia, Tulsa, Princeton, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Austin, Texas, to London, England, and since, 19, or since 2002, Dublin. Much of my research has focused on these manuscripts, and two overriding questions have directed my interests. How did Joyce write this book? And can this information tell us anything interesting or useful? These questions lie behind my early publications, including both the book Ulysses in Progress from 1977 and the James Joyce Archive, the facsimile series of, of the manuscripts. Writers themselves often can't or won't speak directly about their creative processes, and Joyce was certainly no exception to this. But the manuscripts for their works can speak, and because they are less guarded than the writers might be, they can even take us closer to the creative process than is possible from the writer's own accounts. The documents can shed a unique and profound light on the specific literary work, and more generally on literature and on human creativity. Revealing the words the authors wrote, those they eliminated or replaced, their false starts and new beginnings, 
their responses to mistakes the typists or printers made. Manuscripts can show us the ways that a work moved from conception to completion. The documents can't give us direct access to the mental activities that accompanied the writing. But if the record is complete enough, they can provide incredibly valuable and fascinating evidence of creativity and action. James Joyce provides the best example we have among English language writers of the excitement and value of an author's manuscripts. And the manuscripts take us close, as close as we can get to Joyce at work. The surviving notebooks reveal the sources he read and used. The drafts show the various episodes in gestation and development. And the later typescripts and proofs document the unbelievable way he built up Ulysses by adding words and phrases to the typed and printed pages as they passed under his eyes. Up to a third of the words in parts of Ulysses first entered the book in this way. Voluminous as it is, the manuscript record is still very incomplete, but it allows manuscript scholars, or genetic critics, as we now call ourselves since we study the genesis of works, to put together as detailed a picture of an artist in the process of creating a major work of Western culture as any record could be imagined to permit. There are no secrets in the manuscripts, no hidden clues to tell us something that we can't find in the published work, no key to the mysteries. But in watching Joyce write his book, a genetic critic can place Ulysses in the context of its own past, where it becomes embedded in its own history. Ulysses didn't appear out of nowhere, out of time, when it entered the world in 1922, almost 90 years ago now. Although it can seem that way when we read it in a book, or even more so on an iPad, a Kindle, or a Kobo. Scholars have always worked to place Ulysses in its historical context, but genetic criticism lets us see the context, lets us see it in the context of its own earlier selves, its childhood. Like a palimpsest, the words on the page or screen, the version Joyce offered to the world, sit on top of the earlier versions that were never completely erased when Joyce moved beyond them. The French poet Paul Valéry wrote in a notebook from 1922, the same year in which Ulysses was published, that we might consider composition, the poem or novel in the process of being written, as a work in itself, or in Valéry's words, as a dance, as fencing, as the construction of acts and expectations. What kind of dance involving the writer and the work in progress can we envision? An arm's length minuet, as in Jane Austen's day? A seductive waltz or even a tango? A more aggressive hip hop dance? We know from Richard Elman's biography that Joyce spontaneously and with no need for a partner could, in Elman's words, fling his loose limbs about in a spider dance, in a kind of spider dance. But in Valerie's couple, who is leading, the author or the work? Genetic critics, manuscript scholars, engage in a different kind of dance, partnered with a maybe compliant, maybe resistant author who is unquestionably in the lead. Richard Elman's words from almost 50 years, over 50 years ago remain true today. We are still learning to be James Joyce's contemporaries, to understand our interpreter. In my experience, though, working as a genetic critic, dancing with this literary star, hasn't been limited entirely to docilely following Joyce's lead. This supremely egotistical, self-centered, arrogant, unforgiving human being one who was suspicious almost to the point of paranoia, created in Leopold Bloom one of the most generous, resilient, tolerant, and forgiving characters imaginable. A better human being than James Joyce, the Joyce the bio his biographers have to deal with, could ever be. A better human being than I could ever be. Joyce the writer, who had it in him to create Leopold Bloom, was the best of James Joyce. And genetic critics have the unique opportunity to spend their time watching and interpreting that part of him at work. In the past few years, a third question has joined my first two, a third call to the dance. Why do I do this work? Why did I become so interested in Ulysses when I first read it? And why has it continued to interest me so much over more than 40 years now? I've often been asked questions like these, and I've had quick answers ready. I liked reading about a sympathetic Jewish character. I was intrigued by the novels, difficulties, and puzzles. A few years ago, however, these answers stopped satisfying me, and I'm now writing a book that tries to answer the questions in ways that go beyond my easy answers. At one point in Ulysses, wondering why Molly chose him to be her husband, Leopold Bloom thinks simply but eloquently, why did she me? I want to answer my parallel question, 
why did I it? Or why did it me? As honestly and fully as I can. Looking at how my personality, my family, and other aspects of my background, my life up to the few weeks when I was 19 and first read Ulysses at the start of my second year of university, might have contributed to the strong attraction I felt. An attraction that was powerful enough to cement my decision to abandon my original plans to major in math and to switch to English. It was like love at first sight. Almost, it didn't really happen until Ulysses' fourth chapter, when Leopold Bloom first enters the novel. And three months after my high school girlfriend, Molly Peacock, had broken up with me, the book <laughs> offered me a new Molly in Molly Bloom. That was then. What about now? I'm older, I'm much older than Leopold Bloom now. And when I was in my mid-40s, Molly Peacock re-entered my life and became my wife. One of my working titles for the book I'm working on now is My Longest Continuous Adult Relationship. And I'm as interested in exploring why Ulysses has lasted so long for me as in why the connection took hold in the first place. My book from last fall, Ulysses in Focus, Genetic, Textual, and Personal Views, contains both some of my recent essays on Joyce's manuscripts, including a couple on the newly available ones at the National Library of Ireland, and preliminary attempts to answer these personal questions. In my book In Progress, I'm considering my earlier selves in relation to Ulysses as earlier drafts of my life, and I'm trying to look at both the drafts for Ulysses and myself as a genetic critic. Buying books that we don't read isn't the only activity that makes us human, of course. Although Joyce does make a point of noting that Leopold Bloom has books on his shelf that he hasn't read. Those that we do read are even more important. If encountering works of literature makes us more human, then James Joyce becomes more human for me, both as a reader and as a scholar, when I read the products of his imagination and also when I watch him at work. I could evoke Leonard Cohn and say to James Joyce, dance me to the end of love. But will I save the last dance for him? No, for that, I'll invite Leopold Bloom to join in. And together, we'll enjoy the last dance with the two Mollies. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, just before I invite both of our award winners up to receive their, their prize, I just wanted to open the floor to uh, the audience in case there are some questions. Might also be a good opportunity to test them a little bit in terms of their academic prowess uh, to make sure before we actually hand them up. <laughs> are there any questions on two very interesting presentations? And you can see now why we award two prizes each year. If not, please come up, both of you, and we'll do these together. Now, there is a plaque, and there's a check. Is it there? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're a little short this year. <laughs> so, congratulations. I'll hold that up for the camera. We'll do one at a time. Very good. Just stay here. Come on over. We'll give you the. We'll give this to you first. Hold it up and make sure we have a good shot of the. Is that good, Douglas? Maybe I shouldn't say that. He says it's good. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. So we are now then at the end of the formal portion of our presentation. I want to thank all of you for coming. In listening to the talks, I was observing uh, just what a very diverse group this is in terms of faculty and students and staff. We have folks who've come from across the city, from the hospitals, from the university, our affiliated colleges. So I want to thank all of you for making this presentation so special this year. And to invite you to a reception, which will be located in a room close to here, <laughs> just to the right. Just the door to, the right. <laughs> to the right. Thank you, Alcina, and, and your colleagues, and uh, Melissa Franco in my office as well for helping put this together. So we will now adjourn uh, to the uh, reception where you can put your questions to our award winners for this year. As we do, please once again join me in congratulating our two helmets.